Grenade by Alan Gratz, Part 2, pages 180 through 183. Typhoon of Steel Hideki made a rectangle with his fingers and squinted, framing an imaginary photograph. All around him, thousands of Okinawan refugees and Japanese soldiers trudged south in the pouring rain. The Japanese soldiers didn't even stop to go to the bathroom. They urinated as they jogged along the muddy highway none of them willing to pause for even 30 seconds. They had to get to the next line of defensive caves before the Americans caught up. Hidden among them, Hideki was just one of tens of thousands of people clogging the roads. The highway would take them through Shikina to Ichinichibashi, and that's as far as Hideki needed to go. Ichinichibashi was where his sister would be. Hideki had never been this far south before, but wherever he was, it didn't look like Okinawa anymore. American bombs had knocked down trees and taken the tops off hills, stomping the landscape flat like an angry god. Entire villages were shattered. The wooden houses and barns reduced to toothpicks. There was no color to anything anymore. The people, the ground, the sky... They were all a dull, filthy, gray-brown, like all the paints on an artist's palette had been swirled together in a muddy mess. This wasn't Okinawa, not the Okinawa that Hideki knew and loved. Hideki had always used his fingers to frame what he was seeing in front of him, the way the photographer had taught him, but now he did something different. Now he used the frame to imagine the way Okinawa had been before the Americans had invaded, before the Japanese army had brought in cannons and built bunkers. He saw brilliant white coral sand roads lined with waving green palm trees, thatched wooden barns, square houses with red terracotta roofs, women in blue bashofu kimonos with babies strapped to their backs, going to the market, old men in brown bashofu and round straw hats, leading water buffalo to the sugarcane fields. Everywhere he looked, the bright memory of before overlaid the gray, miserable after, like his fingers were making a window into the past, a past that was so recent, so real to him, that he could almost reach out and touch it. Something moved in the corner of Hideki's eye, and he glanced sideways, but nothing was there. I know, I know, he told the ghost of Ray. I'm sorry, I'm trying. Kimiko will be able to help us. We just have to find her first. But how will I ever find her in all this? Hideki wondered. An American fighter plane came roaring right up behind the long line of people, like it was following the highway. It flew so low that Hideki could make out the face of the pilot. Everyone ducked and screamed, but the plane didn't shoot at them. It roared up into the sky and circled high above them for a few seconds before it disappearing into the clouds. The Japanese soldiers among them shoved Hideki and the other Okinawans out of the way as they ran off in all directions, and Hideki suddenly understood. The plane was a spotter for the battleships offshore. It had probably already radioed in where the crowds were. Incoming! Get down! Hideki yelled. He dove off the road into a water-filled ditch as the first shell exploded right in the middle of the highway. The blast was deafening. Hideki held his breath and put his head under the water. The muffled boom shook him and rocked the ground, and he squeezed his eyes shut and drew his arms and legs in tight. Mud and rock and shrapnel pelted him. His world was hellfire and destruction for longer minutes than he could count, punctuated only by quick gasps of air. At last, the bombing stopped. Hideki waited under the water until his lungs burned so much he had to breathe, and he lifted himself up on his hands and knees. The road was gone. And so was everyone who had been on it. Those who had been outside the target area, those who had been spared, got to their feet and hurried on through the carnage, leaving the wounded behind. And Hideki, his eyes dry and his heart hard, did the same.